Shalom, brother and sister. I'm Susan Chen here. Let us start by reciting Psalm 23 together. Let us declare it out loud. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path. For his name's sake, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you that you are our Good Shepherd and we can trust you with our lives. Thank you for your leadership and sovereignty. Thank you for your guidance and care in all our days. Thank you that you restore our soul, give us peace and bring us hope in all of our tomorrows. Thank you for your protection and strength that surround us like a shield. Thank you that we never have to fear. Thank you for your goodness and love that follows after us, chases us, even when we were unaware. Thank you, Lord, that you trustworthy and able, that you are our refuge and hope. In you alone is rest and peace. We praise you for the assurance that we will dwell with you forever. I pray that as I preach for your sermon, May it touches your people. In Jesus' mighty name we ask and pray. Amen. The title of my sermon today is The Power of Love Yet to be Discovered. By looking at the title of my sermon, all of you should know that I will be trying my best to assist you into discovery, like you are watching a discovery channel. And today, of course, is to discover the power of love. Have you thought of why are so many people always wondering what the meaning of love is? Is it our fear of uncertainty in a relationship? Or is it because we ourselves have been accused of not showing love for someone? And why is it that even when we don't fully understand what exactly love is, we tend to make decisions, good and bad, based on love well let me start by defining what is love unfortunately i can't give you a full definition of love as there is so many and complicated in a sense please allow me to give you a general meaning and what it means biblically according to wikipedia Love encompasses a range of strong and positive emotional and mental states from the most sublime virtue or good habit, the deepest interpersonal affection and to the simplest pleasure. An example of this range of meanings is that the love of a mother differs from the love of a spouse, which differs from the love for food. Most commonly, love refers to a feeling of a strong attraction and emotional attachment. Personally, or uh, for this definition, especially for strong feeling of attraction and emotional attachment, I am always in dilemma and confused. But those are the time, la. probably due to my upbringing and past experiences of love. But now, I'm a changed Susan. Well, according to an expert, love is one of the most profound emotions we experience as humans. It is bigger than us, meaning, though we can invite it into our lives, we do not have the control over how, when, and where love starts to express itself. Maybe that's why 72% of people believe in love at first sight. Sometimes, love truly does strike like a bolt of lightning to the chest and you aren't prepared for it. Since love is 
inherently free, we spend nights tossing and turning in an attempt to understand what it is and how to know if we have it. How do you define something so uncontrollable and versatile? That's the tricky things about love. We can feel it in a variety of different states. When we are happy, sad, angry, confused or excited. And our attitudes about love can range from affectionate love to infatuation and pleasure. We even use love as an action, as a force to keep our relationship with partners or friends and family together. What then the Bible, which is God's word to humanity, define love? What does the Bible say about love? 1 John chapter 4 verse 8 says, Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is what the Bible says. When we think of love, it is easy to think about good feelings. But real love is not dependent on feelings. It is about so much more than how I feel about someone. Whether it is romantic love, a member of my family, a friend, a co-worker, so often love is given and received based on what I myself get out of it. But what do I do when it costs me something to love someone? How does the Bible tell us to love? Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. So, what is love then? When I can do all these things in spite of my feelings, regardless of someone's action, that is love. I do not feel loving when I am tempted to anger, to impatience, to seek my own, to believe the worst, to give up on someone. But when I deny these feelings and rejoice, am long-suffering, humble myself, bear with one another, endure all things, that is true love. Love lays down its life. Those natural reactions and demands that are part are part of human nature and expects nothing in return. Wow, those are huge tasks as a Christian, isn't it? How then we can do that? It is not easy. The one and most important principle in order for us to love is to first experience being loved, my brother and sister. God loved us before we love Him. And we certainly did nothing to deserve that love. 1 John chapter 4 verse 10 say, This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Jesus laid down His life for us, the ultimate sign of how much He loved us. He does not love you based upon your performance. There is nothing you can do to cause God to love you anymore that He already does, and there is nothing that will cause God to love you any less. You must know that He loves you even more than you love yourself. Love is a fundamental part of His nature. We are only able to love Him or anyone else because He first loved us, as stated very clearly in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We are only able to give freely to others what we have received freely from Him. That is why I say this is the most important principle to love others. Then, some of you must be thinking, why must I love others? I know that God loves me is enough and then I try la, to become an obedient Christian. I believe that is good enough. Well, being obedient as I have shared last two weeks in Wednesday Praise and Pray, 
Obedience means following His commandment. John in the Bible tells us that God commands us to love. Whether we are speaking of love of God or love of others, love characterizes the divine will for human beings since God is love. All those who are children of God who confess Jesus as the Christ are, the, are to love each other. Abu Dan, please pardon me of my Manglish, but this word really got home. Meaning, obviously, la, there is power of love. That's why our good God desire us to love others according to how we loves, how He loves us. Just that it is yet to be discovered by many of us. Please allow me to discover together with you now. So, what is love doing in us? What difference can love make in our lives? Firstly, the power of love inspires us. Let us read 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 to 16 together. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and there in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Love inspires us. Inspiration is, is simple being touched by the Spirit. And God has touched us by His Spirit because of love. John says in verse 13, We know that we live in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. John begins by reminding his readers again why they can have assurance that they do indeed abide in God and He in them. In an earlier passage, John had state, stated that they could consider the loving deeds that they, they did when their hearts were condemning in them. In John, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. In the words that just precedes this section, John tells his reader that no man has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. There are evidences in our lives that God is at work in us and we truly belong to Him. Those situations and experiences where we see that we are indeed new people in Him can quiet our hearts in times of doubt about who we are. But these are only signs and they are not always consistent. There are times when our anger, hate for another or our indulging in sinful behavior make it very hard for us to feel assured that God does indeed still abide in us. Can't you remember those feelings? So, John now turns again to the deepest evidence of God's presence in our lives. By this, we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His own Spirit in verse 13. Notice John does not say that it is our experience of the Spirit, but the objective reality of the presence of the Spirit in our lives. Also, notice that John said, Jesus has given us of His own Spirit. Jesus does not give us an impersonal force or another spirit like, the, like His. He gives us a share in His very own spirit. We belong to Him because we share in His spirit, the very same spirit that He has. So, our assurance comes from who God is and what He has done, not from what we do or we have done. But then, what assurance do we have that we share in Christ's spirit? We human are full of but then. As such, I need to address all this but then. So, John now reminds his readers that 
he and others have been witnesses of the fact that the father has sent his son as the saviour of the world in verse 14. This is where John began his letter, pro proclaiming that his message involves that which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands in 1 John chapter 1 verse 1. John's message is about an objective reality and he has even an eyewitnesses to it. And what was he an eyewitness to? That the Father has sent his Son as the Saviour of the world. This is a mouthful and John has been unpacking the truth of this phrase throughout his letter. In the great love between the Father and the Son, the Father sends his Son to rescue us, heal us, and make us his own sons and daughters, sharing in this very love of God. Amazing, isn't it? This is the truth that the Father has sent his Son, and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus has changed everything. So, it is our part to recognize, acknowledge, confess this truth, this reality. We do we do not make this true. God is the one who acts toward is, towards us. And John assures his readers that God abides in whoever confesses this truth in verse 15. It is the Son who brings the Spirit. So when John testifies that Jesus was sent by the Father to save the world, this involves the Spirit that led Jesus, the very Spirit He lives for us, when he ascends back to the Father. Where do we look then when we are unsure of the presence of the Spirit in our lives? Of course, we look to the Son. We see his life in the Spirit and trusting in what is revealed of him. We count on that very same Spirit to operate in our lives. In fact, our very confidence our very confession of Jesus being the Son is only possible by the work of His Spirit in our lives, opening our eyes and hearts to the truth. John concludes this thought in the next few sentences, verse 16, So we know and believe the love of God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. In our believing in and trusting in Jesus, we have come to know or experience God's love for us and to trust in His love. It is in Christ and by His Spirit that we know God's love, not just for the world, for the whole world, but for us personally. And we now can count on His love, live as if we are His beloved because we are. So, as we abide in real love, the love that existed before us, we abide in God. We have His very Spirit in us, making us new people, never to be the same as before. And we now live, dwell, play, love, rest in Him, not just nearby or with Him. There is truly a deep sharing between us and our Heavenly Father. This is very amazing. Especially, we can see and in fact, we also experienced before that new Christians are eager to serve the Lord because they, ex they experience the love of God. But after many months or years, their inspirations are getting slower. Why? Because they forgotten or perhaps overlooked on what the power of love can do. It is because many of us or some of us did not study and dwell in the Word of God continuously. The passion for God's Word and God's presence has dimmed. I personally experienced this in my life. I backslidden because life was good. And I was comfortable. I have forgotten him. I don't need him. That's what I thought that time. 
but I praise God, for He never forgets me. Brother and sister, it is time to rediscover for those who has lost the first love and for those who are yet to experience the power of God's love shall seriously take heart to know Him and accept Him as your personal Lord and Saviour. Especially in times like this, where is the best, best place to turn to except to Jesus? I repeat, in times like this, where is the best place to turn to except to Jesus? Now is the time. Now is the time to come back to Him, to experience Him and His love. Secondly, the power of love transform us. Let us read 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 to 18 together. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love dries out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Not only does love inspire us, but love transforms us. Many persons change their lives because of love. It is impossible to be encountered by the love of God and left unchanged. Impossible. Anyone touched by the true love will never be the same again. Love has the power to transform us. I'm sure you agree with me. This is what God wants in each one of us. This is in fact the goal for every Christian life. God doesn't change you so that He can love you. God loves you in order to change you. God's transforming power of His love makes this change possible. Love gives us confidence. In verse 17, John says, In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like Jesus. Experiencing the love of Christ assures us that God worked in us and that gave us confidence. It is in this indwelling of God in us and our abiding in Him that our love grows to perfection. Perfect love will be our ability to perfectly receive and give love to God and all others around us. And in the perfecting of our love, John says, we have confidence in the day of judgment. Our confidence comes from our trusting in His love and His work, receiving from Him and abiding in Him. That's all. The opposite of confidence and love is fear. John now deals with fear in verse 18. We read, There is no fear in love, but perfect love dries up fear. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You don't have to be afraid if you are in the right track. If you are driving in the wrong side of lane, of course you are fearful, isn't it? With all the cars and uh, at the opposite side of yours, you don't feel safe. But if you are in the right track while you are driving, even the police car pass by, you will have no worries nor frightened by them. Fear is a paralyzing emotion. We often find ourselves fearing. When we fear God's punishment, it could very well be because we despair of a recurring sin we cannot seem to get rid of or we can't imagine He can forgive and heal some of the things we have done. We fear because we do not trust that God can really be that loving or that willing and able to transform us. We fear He is putting us to a test and that we, feel we will fail. We fear He will grow tired of us, become impatient, give up on us. And this fear affects then how we approach Him and stunts our ability to recognize and receive his deep love for us. 
Look carefully, look carefully at this verse. John says that the reason perfect love casts out fear is that fear has to do with punishment. So that means that punishment is not what God is up to at all. God who is love casts out all fear that has to do with punishment. God is love, not just kind of love or sometimes love. As I say, love is not just something God does. It is who He is. Huh? Really? Uh, can God really be this good? Some of you may be wondering. My answer is yes. God is not interested in punishing the sinner, only in condemning the sin. God is against sin and He will see it destroyed. But it is just because of His passionate love for us, that's why He is opposed to sin. This is the love the Father shows us in sending Jesus to take our sin and go through the death and separation from God that sin brings. Then conquer death and destroy sin so we can live new lives in Him. All of us need to discover or rediscover that we do not need to fear in living this life as our God is committed to perfecting His love in us in such a way that all our fear is cast out. One of the reasons why I took so long to be back from backsliding is because of fear that God will not accept me. I was too terrible too terrible for him to forgive me. He does not delight a prodigal daughter like me. All this was in my thought because the evil ones did everything to stop me to go back to the Father. But because God's love never fails and is not depend on our doings, here I am today to share this message to you. How wonderful, isn't it? Thirdly, the power of love empowers us. Let us read the last part of my sharing in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 to 21 together. We love because He first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brothers and sisters whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And He has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Love not only inspire us and transform us, but also empower us. In verse 19, we read, We love because He first loved us. I always amaze with this verse. This is very important to understand. If we try to love in our own power, we will fail, definitely fail. If we are going to be successful at loving, it will be because we respond to the one who first loved us. We can be able to love even the unlovable because of God's power of love in us. God was able to love even the enemies. And so, we can also love like that. In verse 20 to 21, we read, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother or sister. What John is saying is that true love is not manifested in words, but shown by deeds. It is easy to say, I love God. It is easy to say, I love you. But it is hard to make it real. God has given us His love, not simply so we can love Him, but so we can love each other. How are we to do this? The truth is that all of us still experience time of anger, dislike, and yes, even hates towards others, even our sister and brothers in Christ. Is John telling his readers just to buck up and by sheer will love those they currently do not? Not at all. 
if he will saying that he could just give the commandment and leave it at that. John wants to enable his readers to more readily participate in the sanctifying work God is doing in our in our, in their lives. He wants them to know that God is love. That this means he is loving them and making them his children. He wants them to see that God's intention is for us to fully participate in the giving and receiving of loving God and others. Out of hope in God's character and work, seen in Jesus and from time to time in their lives, John encourages them to abide in Him, to confess their sins and live in His love and forgiveness. So, we hand God our hate and anger, confessing our need for forgiveness and for his spirit to transform our feeling and perfect our love he is the one who will change us so we hand over each day all that we are our fears and frustrations as well as our faith allowing him to do his loving will in us I would like to testify to you that what's really the power of love can do when come to empowering. I'm sure many of you have heard my testimony regarding my chronic liver disease when I was 31 years old, which doctors said I may have two more years to live. Actually, the medical fees for the treatment was quite high and my cell members came to know that because they are praying for me. And there was one particular cell member who has joined my cell only around one year and we were not very, very close in a sense. One day, I was surprised to get a message from her. If I'm not mistaken, was while Facebook Messenger as there was no WhatsApps or other types of social media at that time. Her conversation to me was rather casual because I believe she does not want me to feel bad or indebted. She told me that she has ringgit Malaysia 20,000 in fixed deposit, where she sort of not using it. She offered it to me for my medical bills and no need to return it. I tell you, my tears immediately flow, not because I needed the money desperately, but because I felt I was so loved. Immediately, I thank God for her who has manifested God's love to me, even though I did not take her money eventually. It must be God's love. As a normal person, it will not be so easy to just do what she has done, even for a wealthy person. This is the beauty of the power of love, my brother and sister. I have said much. In conclusion, I would like to remind us that love inspires us, transforms us, and empowers us. All these are to give glory to our gracious and merciful God, for He deserves all our adoration. Of course, none of us perfectly live out this love, and yet, it is still our calling and our purpose as followers of Jesus, the one who perfectly embodied God's love. There is a saying, some people do good because the law requires it. Others do good because love desires it. My wish is that all of us will choose to love because our God is love. Brother and sister, let us love no matter what. Don't let Others think, you know, stop us from loving. Nothing is impossible because God is loving us because it is all about Him. When filled with God's love, we can do and see and understand things that we could not otherwise do or see or understand. I urge you to be filled with His love. We can endure pain, suppress fear, Forgive freely, avoid contention, renew strength 
and bless and help others. These are the wonderful things God wants us to do. When you are hearing this sermon, can I humbly ask you to focus on God and pray? How would you want this power of love do to you and people around you? Shalom, brother and sister. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Amen.